Thank you. Uh, appreciate uh, the um, uh, participation and attendance. And as, as uh, Ryan mentioned, this is uh, all about um, uh, some of the latest uh, innovations in uh, uh, technology for aircraft actuation. And um, we'll start here. There's. Uh, Okay, uh, that's the uh, the agenda. Uh, a brief um, intro, uh, which um, basically I've, I've gone through already. Uh, deal with some of the key issues, or at least what we feel are the key issues. Uh, some of the uh, advance advancements that have been made on the technology front by Steinmeier. Uh, we'll just briefly go through some application examples, um, draw some conclusions, um, and then just open it up from there. So the first thing is, uh, again, our perception of uh, uh, key issues. And for us, uh, the key issues break down into two. One is the general topic of uh, hydraulics versus electromechanical, um, which is a, certainly an ongoing uh, issue. And then uh, uh, the technology, which relates to um, the design of the, um, in this case, the ball screw, uh, some of the materials used, and then um, some of the uh, innovative things that have gone on most recently, and, and it's mostly in the area of uh, wipers and scrapers. So first thing is uh, hydraulics uh, versus electromechanical. And uh, obvious question is, uh, which one? Um, you know, hydraulics are cer certainly still extensively utilized uh, for actuation, uh, but there's certainly a trend that is uh, migrating towards uh, electromechanical, and that's abbreviated by uh, the EMA designation. And the question, of course, is why? And uh, certainly from our perspective, because we do participate in, uh, in EMA uh, and don't do hydraulics, uh, we feel that there are certainly some uh, clear advantages. Um, among them are, are low maintenance. Um, uh, the, the main thing here is that uh, uh, this is uh, this is a, what is known as green technology. Um, so it's environmentally friendly. Uh, there's no oil. There's no leaking of oil. Uh, possible reduced weight because again you're not dealing with uh, separate reservoirs, uh, one or more, uh, and certainly no hoses. Um, somewhat higher efficiency, uh, and that's again uh, more related to ball screws, not necessarily lead screws. Um, simpler, more modular design, and then um, uh, better speed control uh, from uh, a servo perspective for uh, EMA. Um, here are just a few pictorial examples of uh, applications where ball screws are used, and they range in the upper left-hand corner from utility actuators. Um, there are a couple of flap screws shown uh, on the upper right and the lower left. And then the lower right uh, happens to be a, um, uh, a, a, a ball screw design that's used in an electric brake actuator. Uh, and that one actually has uh, what's, what we call an inverted design. That means that the ball return is actually in the shaft as opposed to the nut. And, and we'll give another example of that later on. <clears throat> so uh, getting back to the uh, technology issue, um, that immediately brings up uh, the various ball return types that are utilized. Um, here are pictorial examples of uh, what Steinmeier considers to be the current state of the art. And uh, one thing you may notice uh, in all of these designs of uh, ball returns is that we absolutely do not use any tubes at all. Um, and our focus here today is on the, these first two types the one in the upper left-hand corner, and then the next one in the uh, uh, upper center. <clears throat> uh, the first example uses what, what we call uh, an individual ball deflector return. And the second example uses um, a liner return. And again, it's just uh, think of it as uh, multiple internal returns in, in series. <clears throat> and then, as, as noted, both are examples of what we would consider uh, uh, internal ball return. So that begs the question of what's the difference between internal return and external return, and what are some of the 
uh, key characteristics and especially uh, possible failure modes of them. And in this case, we're going to restrict our discussion of external returns to uh, ball screws that use tubes because that's the most typical um, methodology that is, uh, that is utilized. So with, with internal ball return, essentially you're dealing with, uh, with the recirculating balls lifted from a one thread and then just going to an adjacent one either before or after uh, the, the, uh, the current thread and it, that depends on the direction of motion. Um, and basically the balls are guided sideways very, very, you know, we can call it kind of gently, uh, just a, a slight angular uh, uh, deviation. And so there's no radial deflection whatsoever. Uh, they are unloaded upon entering the return piece, and that's by design. Um, and in the uh, drawing that's shown, uh, we are showing one. Actually, that ball nut has three ball returns. You're only seeing one of them. The other two are hidden in back. Uh, but basically, one circuit of balls is equal to one turn, and that's called the individual deflector design. Uh, in the in the multi-turn or the liner design, uh, one one circuit ha would have many several turns. Basically, the balls stay on the screw screw surface and um, cross over into the next track, and that's why sometimes this type of a return is called a crossover. <clears throat> so uh, you can compare that to a uh, a tube or a um, a tunnel return, in this case, think of that piece above the shaft there as a tube. And you can see that, um, that basically the balls are, are guided up and over and then back down into the thread, which means they have to make two 90-degree turns, as shown. And then also they have to be guided into that channel somehow. And typically what is used uh, by uh, most manufacturers that make these kinds of devices, especially with tubes, is they use either a pin or some sort of scooper device that reaches under the ball and basically lifts it off the track and then guides it into the return channel. Uh, and typically in this kind of a design you have um, one circuit being uh, several turns, one and a half typically or two and a half turns. And again, the reason why we call this an external return is that the balls are guided away from the, the uh, shaft thread and then back into it. So let's compare uh, the liner return to the external tube type return and uh, just go down one by one. You can see that the, uh, the first point is that uh, with the liner, uh, the ball nut is entirely closed. There is nothing exposed. There's no openings, no holes. With a tube type, you obviously have to have a couple of holes in the nut uh, for each tube. Um, the liner does not need any pins or fasteners in order to facilitate the uh, recirculation of the balls, whereas uh, with the tube, the, um, uh, it generally requires some external device, either a pin or a scooper. Um, so back to the liner, you've got uh, minimal piece count uh, for a ball nut. Uh, typically, there's just two pieces plus the balls, uh, not counting scrapers, dog stops, those kinds of things. Um, and uh, always with an external or tube type return, you've got a higher piece count, especially with the pins. And or some, usually there's some sort of fastener that's utilized to keep the tube in place. Um, in terms of a failure mode with the liner, uh, there's just no possibility of a loss of balls because everything is inside the nut. So it's not possible to lose the ball return. Uh, the only possibility is if you have a, a completely catastrophic failure and the balls are, are essentially reduced into dust. Um, and um, even in that case, the ball nut still is going to move uh, relatively freely on the shaft, allowing uh, uh, the engagement of the secondary low path. You, you can compare that to a tube where if for, for some reason you, you break the tube or uh, the balls fall out, uh, there is no indication of any such failure uh, and no one knows that, that uh, you've lost all the balls in the ball screw. Um, and what will end up happening 
uh, under those conditions is that the, the nut is still going to ride on the pins or the scoopers extending into the uh, channel. Um, and um, uh, those, those features basically have to shear off completely before the secondary load path is able to engage. So those are the, uh, kind of the comparison. So, so why doesn't Steinmeier use tubes at all? And we've never used tubes. Um, uh, one of the main reasons is that we believe that, that um, in order to ensure proper recirculation, we follow the natural path of the ball. And that's, uh, uh, we call that the t tangential path. And you'll see that in any Steinmeier ball return. Um, obviously, no additional pins or hardware needed. Um, the the uh, use of a liner means that there's no openings whatsoever in the nut body, so the loss of the ball return is impossible. And then, of course, because tubes um, uh, have to be sealed somehow uh, against the uh, uh, next to the ball nut, uh, lubricant can certainly leak out. Um, this is a typical example of an um, internal return. Uh, this happens to be uh, an electric brake actuator. And uh, this part is made of exactly three pieces, not counting the balls, uh, the screw shaft, the nut, and the multi-liner. And uh, the total weight on this assembly is about 700 grams. And uh, it develops a uh, maximum force of about uh, 53 kilonewtons. So, um, pretty impressive. Uh, here's another example of internal return, um, again, utilizing a liner. Um, so again, you, you don't see any hardware um, and nothing holding things in place. Um, it's a very simple, simple compact, uh, very reliable design. Um, so <clears throat> moving onward uh, in the technology arena, uh, we get into materials. And um, certainly for aerospace materials, we're, we're uh, uh, being in this business, you're fami we're familiar with uh, the, the range of alloy steels, uh, the 9310s, the 4340s. Uh, we certainly uh, have extensive experience uh, with tool steels. Um, uh, the closest thing in, in the US is 52100. Uh, also experience with stainless steels. Uh, those are series 440s. And as you may know, we don't do anything in series 300 because it's just not uh, able to be uh, hardened enough. Um, we also are familiar with um, the late, uh, latest developments, which are uh, in uh, corrosion-resistant steels, such as Coronador 30, uh, which, which does not require any plating at all. And uh, most, uh, most uh, 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 manufacturers in the, in the aerospace market uh, would like to avoid plating uh, uh, if they possibly can because of flaking and, and uh, debris and stuff. So uh, we have experience with typical coatings, uh, thin dense chrome and uh, diamond-like coating, but again, if, um, if uh, given the preference, we would prefer to avoid that. In terms of uh, material choice for um, uh, the, the parts, the, the, those are most often uh, defined by the source control drawing or the specification. Um, uh, our wipers, uh, depending on the application, can vary anywhere from a plastic like a PTFE to a uh, metal brass uh, to newer exotic materials, and we'll go into some of that uh, when we talk about wipers. Scraper materials are typically stainless, like 15.5 uh, pH. Okay, getting moving, moving rapidly forward into the area of innovation, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, Um, the, uh, the prime um, focus on this has been um, on wipers and scrapers, which seems to be um, a, a specific um, concern among um, aerospace manufacturers, aerospace actuator manufacturers. Um, Steinmeier, being in the ball screw business for more than 50 years, and a dominant player in, um, in industrial applications certainly has seen our share of um, applications and, and uh, issues with wipers. So we, we, we take that experience and we apply it to the aerospace sector. And um, uh, that allows us to push the state of the art in um, uh, wiper and scraper design. 
And as, as you may know, um, in, because of the, um, the, the very wide temperature range that uh, aerospace uh, actuators typically have to um, go through, um, ideally what you're really looking for is a highly flexible wiper with a, which is characterized by both a low coefficient of thermal expansion and also a coefficient of low coefficient of friction, which historically has been pretty difficult to achieve to date. Okay, uh, so here's one example of uh, a, um, uh, a wiper. This one happens to be for uh, uh, an A400 uh, 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 program, uh, and it's for a ram air door, and it's a, a slotted brass wiper. You can see the the, the slot clearly, and that's for uh, allowing for uh, the temperature expansion. Um, this one uh, shows an example of a uh, uh, an ice scraper, an end stop, and that's that's uh, for an HSTA screw. So that's considerably larger than the previous example, and um, uh, that one is made out of 15.5 uh, pH. You might notice just uh, by way of uh, information up in the uh, that little tab on the on the right hand side uh, has a, a laser laser code on it, and that's what we uh, we we engrave in, in each part uh, as a as a method of identifying it. Um, this is a, another uh, example of a wiper. This one is a uh, slotted, as you can see. You can clearly see the the the, the slot in the middle there. Uh, with uh, it's a PTFE wiper uh, with a um, O-ring seal for for again this one's also for an HSTA screw. This one happens to be used on the uh, Russian jet Super Superjet 100. Um, this one here is um, uh, brass and PTFE. Uh, it's an ice scraper and also a wiper, and that's for a a, a flap uh, also on the Superjet. <clears throat> So uh, and now and now um, for something completely different for for all you uh, Monty Python fans um, made from proprietary metal uh, instead of plastic um, we're investigating that uh, we're manufacturing uh, ma manufacturing it currently uh, it's um, obviously because it's metal you can machine it more accurately than you can from plastic um, and. Um, the fact that we're, we've combined or we're attempting to combine an ice scraper with a wiper uh, minimizes the nut length and also the weight, so that's a good thing. Um, this one is designed with very little space between the screw shaft and the wiper, so uh, there's no additional torque, but also no real wiping since it is a, a metal um, wiper, if you will. So um, prototypes are made, waiting to be tested, and uh, this is the uh, the design uh, as shown pictorially. Um, and once again, as with many Steinmeier Aerospace design, this wiper uses absolutely no hardware. Um, it is uh, captured in the in the uh, same groove that holds the liner. You can see the tab on the bottom there. Uh, that's that's showing that it is that slides into the uh, where the um, uh, where the uh, liner typically goes, and uh, it's currently undergoing testing. And then, uh, uh, not not resting on those laurels, we're also looking at a another material that that uh, seems to have some promise uh, from a uh, company in England, uh, Morgan Advanced Materials. It is a carbon composite. This one actually does have both a low coefficient of thermal expansion, also a uh, low coefficient of friction. Um, and the key advantage with this one is we might be able to actually wipe the shaft throughout a very wide temperature range, which would really be um, a, a plus. So uh, moving on to some application examples. Um, this one you saw uh, earlier. Uh, this is a ram air door actuator screw. That's probably about a 16 millimeter diameter, 5 millimeter pitch. Um, so that's a utility actuator. Uh, this one's um, a, a flap screw and also a flap screw shown on the lower left and on the right side is the HSTA uh, with multiple nuts um, for um, uh, safety um, and there are four, four, 
flap screws per wing, so there's a total of eight, eight flap screws and then one HSTA in one airplane, so nine ball screws in one airplane. Um, this one you saw again previously is an example of, a, um, um, of a, an application. This one uh, is uh, one that's an uh, electronic brake that's used on a helicopter. And then again, uh, uh, note the inverted design. You can see the, um, uh, the return is in the shaft. But again, the liner, uh, utilizing the liner, and again, there's no additional hardware holding that in place. Um, flaps for the um, Embraer Phenom 100. Um, again, a flap screw for, uh, for the uh, Mitsubishi MRJ. Um, that one is made out of uh, Chronador. Um, this is a, another flap screw that's used on the um, Airbus and the FS. And then this, uh, this is a mini screw that's used on um, the uh, Joint Strike, Strike Force F-35, uh, the missile. Uh, so uh, fin actuator, very small, um, obviously a very short lifetime required, but nevertheless it is a ball screw actuator. Um, and then uh, various utility actuators, uh, will, uh, these happen to be, the one on the left happen to be on 777s, and the one on the right is um, uh, a utility actuator that's, um, that's being utilized on the 747 uh, as a prototype right now. Uh, and then again, you previously saw this one that uh, for an electronic brake, uh, as mentioned before. So um, conclusions, uh, we certainly feel that, that uh, electro electromechanical actuators will continue growing, uh, especially for flight critical uh, applications such as flaps and HSTAs. Uh, ball screws are increasingly the drive mechanism of choice um, because of their advantages in terms of um, um, efficiency primarily in that case. Um, Experience in aerospace, aerospace is certainly required of a supplier, um, and um, certainly uh, with our extensive background in, in uh, manufacturing ball screws, we certainly have that. Uh, and then the in engineering innovation that uh, was, was, in this case, primarily focused on, on wipers and scrapers is, is really qu quite essential in terms of staying ahead, as well as the, the, um, the innovative ball returns. That's it. Thank you very much, George. Um, we don't have any questions and answers at this point, um, but what we'll be doing is sending out the uh, presentation afterwards so everyone can look at this. And if there are any questions, uh, please feel free to email George at the uh, email on the screen.